Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to Avana India Climate Week 2024. This is our second edition. This roundtable, uh, round the clock, renewables and energy storage is part of day two of our day three of our uh, AICW 2024. Um, so incredibly honored that all of you expected, uh, accepted our invitations and are here with us today. Thank you so much. And a big, big thank you to RMI and to Arjun for leading and moderating this uh, roundtable and uh, putting together all the hard work during the last few days. Of course, as part of the today's topic, what we are looking for is to deep dive, uh, try to identify some of the challenges, opportunities, gaps that we are looking to solve in the space so we can accelerate innovation, accelerate more work going into it, and um, and inspire more in, uh, entrepreneurs in the climate tech ecosystem to solve for these gaps and um, you know innovate further. So with that context, I would like Arjun to please introduce yourself and uh, then take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Avartika, and appreciate everyone who could join us today. Uh, this is a very relevant topic around the clock renewables and battery storage, and I'm excited to have the kind of experts we have on this call today. Uh, what I'm going to do is we'll give a quick introduction about myself, about my journey in the sector. And I would love to hear the same from you guys also to set the context. Uh, we usually do a quick check-in question just to, you know, like break the ice. And the check-in question for today will be, what excites you the most about this sector, both RE and battery storage? Uh, so I'll start and then I'll pass it over to the rest of the panelists. So hello again, my name is Arjun Gupta, manager at RMI. Uh, and I work on the electricity side of uh, the team. RMI, as you may know, is a think-do-scale tank, uh, philanthropy primarily. And uh, we provide support to governments on the energy transition side of things. Uh, with that being said, uh, my own journey uh, in this space has been uh, quite old. Uh, I am almost a veteran here. I've been in the sector for 10 years now um, and counting. And um, I started my bachelor's, luckily, was in uh, solar technology uh, as a specialization, did a master's in renewable energy. And then I spent six years with a developer in the US doing rooftop solar. And across that six years, I really believed that solar power is going to be the uh, future of the power sector. And so far, I think I've got it right, and hopefully it continues as well. Um, what excites me the most about this sector is the fact that Today, it's not about solar being cheap, expensive, whatnot. Everyone can access solar. But now we're looking at how do we get consumers who don't have roofs and do not have access to capital also to start adopting it and really uh, make it work for themselves. And we at RMI are constantly innovating different ways to get or empower consumers to adopt solar. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it to uh, our first panelist, uh, Vaishnavi from Tata Power, and would love to hear more about you. Thank you, Arjun, for setting the context. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vaishnavi Prabhakaran. I head sustainability at Tata Power, and um, I have been with Tata Power for the last 15 years. Prior to that, uh, my bachelor's is in instrumentation and electronics, and I did a full-time um, MBA from SPGen. Um, I joined uh, Tata Power in a very exciting space, which was Tata Power Trading. And uh, you know that kind of set the context in the sector for me because there were very new things happening and it was a sunshine sector at, in, in the year 2009. And, um, you know, when you ask me what excites me most about uh, renewables and storage is that I've personally seen in the last, uh, you know, one and a half decades, the pace at which change is happening and, uh, you know, how we are able to tap limitless renewable energy uh, to unlock the growth potential for our country. So we've seen many examples like microgrids, rooftop solar, et cetera, where uh, both the consumer mindset, the government and large corporations have come together uh, to accelerate the change. So I am very excited to see how technology can accelerate uh, the space further. Thank you for that, uh, Vashmi. Very cool. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Rahul next from uh, JSW Energy. I'd love to hear more from you. Right. Uh, Arjun, one small correction. I am from JSP Group, no, not JSW, but uh, yeah. So, uh, be, hi, everyone. I am Rahul Jain. Uh, been in the renewable space for almost now one and a half decades, roughly. Uh, been with Jindal Renewables. This is a new platform. Uh, got uh, uh, incorporated last year, early last year. And that's, that's when uh, I also joined uh, here as head of strategy and business development. 
uh, again, uh, being from, uh, let's say now being from a hard to abate sector, uh, how do we incorporate uh, renewables? How do we integrate renewables? Primarily, how, how do we convince, uh, uh, let's say, a promoter having uh, captive coal mines, captive uh, thermal power plants to shift to a, a renewable space? While well, yes, uh, solar is definitely uh, among the cheapest uh, form of energy now. But again, uh, dispatchability and uh, firmness, which is the, uh, let's say, the session uh, uh, agenda, I think that becomes very, very uh, core to uh, what we are now trying to do. So I think we will uh, would be happy to hear from uh, all of the experts here and uh, would be happy to exchange my views as well. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you, Rahul. I'll pass it next to Anand Jain from AERM. Would love to hear your thoughts. Hi, uh, thanks, Arjun, and great to meet everybody. Uh, so the company, Arjun, is Aram. We call it Aram. So uh, uh, like Rahul, yeah, Rahul, where we were colleagues uh, earlier, we were I mean, in the same sector. I was doing utility-scale solar. So uh, a professional career of about 22 years now. Uh, started in 2000 with in financial services in Mumbai. So I was a fixed-income analyst and, a, and an economist. Uh, last stint was with the ICICI Bank Treasury uh, as a research uh, research analyst. Then I went to US for my MBA. I did my MBA at Yale. Uh, and at that time, I wanted to be on the Wall Street. So went to Wall Street, uh, worked with Lehman Brothers. Uh, and then Lehman went bankrupt in 2008. Uh, went to Barclays, spent two years in the power group there. And that's where I picked up renewables. So something like, you know, all of these uh, with Rahul Arjun, you talked about one and a half decades of solar. So I, I, I came back, Mr. Modi was announcing the first solar policy of India, even before National Solar Mission was announced, actually. And uh, I came back, met him, did a little bit, little bit of advice to shape up the policy there. And then he said, why don't you do a project in this policy itself? Come back and do it. Policy so itself. I came back uh, came back and uh, took up a 10 megawatt project in the very first uh, solar policy of India, which was in Gujarat. Uh, then, of course, the rest is history, uh, you know, uh, National Solar Mission followed. So, yeah, so started there, uh, uh, you know, went to KPMG after that, set up their solar practice a couple of years I spent there. Then... Then I wanted to be in industry and not be in, a, be in consulting, really. So uh, then I was head of BD for uh, Kiran Energy, where I kind of like pioneered third-party sales for solar back in 2012 to 14. And then I spent uh, the rest of like six years with uh, first Sun Edison. So I was head of Western India. Again, Sun Edison was a pioneer, one of the largest renewable company globally, and one of the largest one in India. And, and kind of Asia Pacific headquarters was here itself. So we, I used to manage Asia Pacific first year and then became head of Western India Sun Edison uh, in the second year. So build large assets there uh, for solar. And then I became country head for Sky Power, uh, again, a Canadian IPP. Uh, uh, so built about 400 megawatts under my leadership, invested about 2,000 crores. So overall, uh, 15 years of uh, solar experience. Uh, largely, I could say, was in utility scale, uh, building uh, kind of like about, responsible about 1,500 megawatts overall. Along the way, we saw the problem what that rooftop really was not taking off in India. You know, it, it was a non known problem. There was literature, lots of write-ups and all of that not taking off. And then and so I deep dived deep dived in 19 why it was not really, you know. So I figured the financing was one issue and then the ecosystem, right? The the confidence or the trust deficit between stakeholders was the second issue. So we conceptualized Aram back in 1920 to really uh, uh, solve for that. So we started with financing. We got our own banking license and we pioneered a credit product. So I started lending for rooftop solar because none of the banks were doing it at that time. Now some of the banks have stepped in and started doing it. Uh, but rather it was, but at that time it was really driven more by uh, state bank programs, which were backed by World Bank. And they, they all of that capital again went to large corporates itself. So, uh, you know, nothing was available for MSME. So we created this Credit product, a bank uh, that specializes in lending for rooftop solar. We we are the only NBFC or lending institution just focused on solar. And then we have uh, Commerce Arm to which we supply. And then we're building a lot of tech. Like because one of the problems that we saw was the ecosystem. So we started building a lot of tech tech in the tech for the stakeholders, which is uh, a monitoring platform, uh, 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 a platform for installers. So lots of that. So it's all integrated uh, approach to uh, helping. Uh, solve for rooftop solar lag that you see in India. Uh, globally, it does really well. And that's what excites me. What excites me is to get a solarize each and every commercial and industrial roof, at least starting with, and then maybe move to resi. Uh, we've started to see that there is an inflection point we already see in this Thank space. You. 
and i think the next we next uh, next next frontier is uh, is is the uh, round the clock uh, power oh, reserve with, with storage uh, with storage it just it becomes a uh, phenomenal uh, phenomenal ability or and and uh, value proposition uh, so yeah which is what we'll talk about thank you great anand thank you so much for that i'll uh, pass it to watsal mubara hi thank you arjun uh, a brief background i am an engineer by training from iit delhi i graduated in 2014 and i am probably the youngest person on this panel in the in the space itself i used to be a founder before uh, i used to work in the education space i worked with an early stage startup in the education stay, uh, space and i ran my own startup uh, for 5 years after i wrapped up this up last year i was actually figuring out what to do next and uh, climate and the energy space was very exciting to me and uh, i want to learn more about it and be a part of this massive shift which is going to happen the next decade and uh, again next, next and and so i joined avana last year and since then i have been part of the investment team looking at energy uh, as a big uh, sector within avana across the entire climate segment and the potential really is something which excites me uh, given the everybody really didn't knows the shift but the numbers are just huge let's say if we get to a to meet a 500 gigawatt of renewable energy target we need at least 200 gigawatt hours of storage and uh, we are at less than 1% of that so this essentially creates massive opportunities and as an evc it excites us a lot because there will be innovations across the value chain uh, and, and there will not be one single winner so this is the opportunity is something which excites me a lot in this space great thank you atsal and agree with all your points there from the need and the speed it's required uh, i'll pass it to ayush quickly Hey, thanks, Arjun. Uh, Arjun, I felt a little bad when you called. You know, ten years in the space as uh, being a veteran. Uh, I, th- I thought I, it is not. I, I felt like I had spent about ten years, and I was like, man, am I really like falling uh, in the veteran category now? I'd I'd like to believe like you know I'm still a youngster in a very sort of young space. Uh, I think uh, this space is just getting started. Um, so i started uh, my career with uh, uh with clean max solar i was one of the initial members at clean max solar they were one of the pioneers in third party ppas with corporate clients uh prior to that i was uh, uh, finishing off my uh, graduation from iit bombay uh did my masters in lithium ion batteries i uh, didn't really come up with any significant breakthrough in battery technology but uh, you know a lot of those abstracts which you have in those scientific papers uh, kind of lay out the the potential of the technology and i think i got pretty excited by the by the impact that something like that would have uh, going forward uh, and i'm very lucky to be like sort of living through uh, that particular journey in my uh, professional career as well uh, so we started off in uh, 2017 uh, uh, our goal is to uh, at ampere hour like our our goal is to build hardware and software technology for uh, energy storage uh, so we cater to a wide variety of different applications you know whether it's microgrids in nigeria or rural india uh, to decarbonizing utilities so whether it's distribution companies transmission companies helping make renewable energy more predictable uh using energy storage so there's a wide variety of different uh types of um, uh, applications that our systems are being utilized for and what is super exciting for me is that uh you know we are really living through a once in a generation transition right like the power systems have been this old a super boring industry which has not been touched for a very long period of time and all of a sudden uh, because of like pretty much couple uh, you know sort of accelerated by the need for energy transition i think there's a lot of innovation that is happening uh, there's a lot of new technology that is coming in it's a complicated problem like technology alone can't fix it you need financing you need regulatory policy you need manufacturing so it's a complicated problem to solve but the scale of this is so big that i don't think that there is anything like it uh, so that is what is super exciting about the space right now. thank you ayush uh, and thank you for not making me feel bad about my age <laughs> <laughs> pass it to rishad next 
for a quick introduction. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, Rushad Nanavati, I um, lead Third Derivative, which is a global climate tech accelerator uh, affiliated with or attached to the Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, so no urgent well in that context. Um, over the last four years since we established it, uh, it's grown into one of the most robust early stage climate tech ecosystems in the world. So at this point, 234 portfolio companies, also a very selective portfolio, something like a 6% acceptance rate into the program, um, collectively um, has, has raised well over uh, $2 billion. We partner very closely with Avana Capital in the context of our portfolio and ecosystem in India and are very grateful for that partnership. Uh, and long duration energy storage, uh, or I, I should say all durations of energy storage, short, medium, long, is, a, is an absolutely key area of focus. We uh, like to think of ourselves as an organization that stays ahead of the emissions, i.e. anticipates future energy and decarbonization challenges, and obviously the integration of variable renewable energy as those proportions rise is absolutely mission critical in the context of energy access and, and, and grid decarbonization. And so as far as the power sector is concerned, that this is probably our most significant area of focus. We have about uh, 10, uh, I think, truly world uh, leading uh, energy storage companies in the portfolio, several more that are focused on uh, the software and enablement side of things, including uh, a couple of companies in, in India that we're really proud of. Um, and this is going to be continue to be a, a, a pretty serious area of focus for us. And since sort of age seems to be a theme, uh, I have a particular interest in, in this because actually uh, 10 years ago, I, I uh, was a startup founder myself developing off-grid and microgrid based renewable energy plus storage projects in Southeast Asia uh, using both redox flow and and uh, and lithium ion battery systems. Uh, and, you know, it was a no brainer for me back then. Uh, and uh, it's only become uh, even more so in any number of applications today. So uh, this particular technology area is is uh, something that I, that I care deeply about and have um, seen the sort of positive impact of it in, um, in the context of small island settings with really, really unreliable power, uh, intermittent power, uh, sort of firsthand. And I truly believe that what we're going to be talking about today is um, is going to be game changing uh, in India, not just from a pure sort of power delivery standpoint, but from obviously an environmental health and public health standpoint as well. And that's one of the reasons I'm, uh, I think I'm really, really excited about its potential globally, but its potential in, in India in particular. Great, thank you, Rashad. And finally, Dave from WF, would love to hear from you. Thanks, Arjun. Hello, everyone. So uh, there were many similarities as, as I was going through what everyone was speaking. I did my bachelor's in instrumentation and I don't want to even say what I did my master's in. I did my master's in thermal power plant engineering and <laughs> thereafter was with CLP for a good nine years. I started off as a gas plant operator, moved over to wind construction, asset management, then solar and over time moved over to energy storage. So I've gone through kind of an energy, uh, energy transition myself. Uh, and uh, I also did my MBA from SPJN, Vaishnavi, so we are alumni together. And uh, thereafter in, the in 2019, I shifted to customized energy solutions. That was when I got into the energy storage world. Uh, initial years working with SECI, MOP, MNRE in forming policies, guidelines, helping Seki with various of the tenders, initial tenders that they were releasing. And uh, in 21, I moved over to KPMG. I was leading the energy storage and renewable 
advisory services there. And last year, I moved over to World Economic Forum. I lead the energy practice for the forum in India, looking into whatever the forum wants to do in the clean energy space in India. Five areas we look into uh, energy storage, clean hydrogen, CCUS, sustainable aviation fuels, and SMRs, advanced nuclear. Storage is very close to my heart. And uh, I love keeping a track of this bucket because it doesn't let you sleep. It changes every day. So that's the most exciting part of this area. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you, Dev. I agree with everything you just said as well. So I think with that, let me just set the context of why we're having this conversation. We'll dive right into the questions after that. So let's talk about India for a second, right? So uh, India today is number fourth uh, in terms of the RE capacity deployed globally, which is a big feat. I think we're number three in solar power capacity, number four in wind capacity. And we have this mammoth target of 500 gigawatts, as you all may know, by 2030. And we are sitting on about 200 gigawatts right now. So another 300 gigawatts to go in the next six years. That's about 50 gigawatts a year. Uh, now, what's interesting is that MNRE has obviously a bidding trajectory of about 50 gigawatts that they've announced. And uh, what's encouraging is that a lot of the um, uh, PSUs like SECI, NTPC, NHPC, SJVN have already issued 53 gigawatts of tenders already. So in terms of actually getting towards the targets, you're making good progress. And in terms of actual deployments, I think we are looking at about 26 gigawatts of RE deployments this year, which is double of what we did last year. So things are moving along well, but we are still only at 26 gigawatts of deployment and we need to get to 50 every year consistently to get to that large target we have. So we still need to double the pace of deployment from where we stand right now. And that is something that uh, we hope that uh, this discussion can help uh, resolve. One other important element that we saw this summer especially is that there is this significant drive in energy demand, electricity demand and peak demand in India. We're looking at about a doubling of electricity demand in the next seven years or so. And peak demand is going to go up by about 50% in uh, the next seven years again. Now, what's happening is that this summer especially, what we realize is that about 140 gigawatts of RE capacity was online. But at the peak hour, only about 10 gigawatts was available, which is the non-solar peak hour. So which means that we're not really able to use the clean energy resources, the clean capacity to meet the peak demands or when electricity demand is the highest uh, in, in the summers. And there is a need to plug that gap of peak demand rising with clean energy to help you know, uh, our energy transition story this decade. So with that in mind, I think I would like to start the line of questioning. Uh, we'll talk about renewable energy around the clock first and then go into battery storage. So my first question, I think, is again for Ms. Vaishnavi from Tata Power is that what does RERTC really mean and why is it important for India's energy transition journey? Uh, so I think you've given me the simplest and most uh, context setting question. Uh, so RE, um, RTC is round the clock which means 24 cross seven power from renewable sources throughout the year, because there are seasonal variations also. And that does impact how renewable capacity generation happens. And it is absolutely important for India, given its goal of 500 gigawatt that we have, uh, because there, um, there needs to be grid stability and intermittency of renewable power is something that can continue to be a concern. Um, I think there is a shift in mindset um, rather than looking at availability of renewable energy, we are trying to now move in the sector to try and meet the demand of energy, and which is where the entire concept of firm and dispatchable uh, renewable energy is emerging. And that's uh, very exciting, and Tarapar is already in the space. Uh, we have a project uh, uh, with the SJVN, and this is a 460 megawatt uh, FDRE project that we have taken up. Um, and again, I think you partly answered it, but I would like to know more from you that why do you think it's important for India to focus more on that? We've done a lot of plain vanilla, solar, wind, but why is RTC becoming so important uh, for India this decade? Uh, so Arjun, I thought I, I captured that when I said that uh, renewable power can be intermittent. And when there is intermittent power, then the you know grid stability comes to question. So to be able to replace conventional power, we require storage capacity. So there are a certain number of hours that you have solar power, certain number of hours that you have wind. Uh, hydro plays an important role uh, when we are looking at renewables, but all of it put together really cannot uh, you know, uh, meet the uh, RTC requirement without storage capacity coming in. 
So that is something that is absolutely critical for us to be able to ramp up the renewable capacity uh, based uh, generation that is there in India to meet Thank our so renewable. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, I think my next question was for Rahul. So Rahul, you're also quite active uh, in the whole FDRE space and we are seeing an evolution of RTC to FDRE. Now, FDRE is relatively newer for India. So love, like to know what does FDRE really mean? And is there a difference between RTC and FDRE, uh, if any at all? Right, very well, valid uh, question, Arjun. So yes, it has been, uh, uh, I think, uh, parts of the same coin, uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, well, I also try and uh, tackle your earlier question also. Uh, I just wanted to add my two cents onto it. See, uh, almost over a decade, more than a decade, we were focusing on uh, adding capacities, uh, renewable capacities, and that's it, uh, right? Uh, for the last five, six years, I'm seeing a big transition uh, moving from capacity addition to solution building, uh, right? And RTC, FDRE, all these are all part of solution building. Uh, it is actually attacking the right requirement. Uh, right. So apart from intermittency, it is also uh, tackling the uh, the the require the gap between demand and supply. Right. That is that is the difference between and see both RTC and FDRE are tackling uh, uh, are trying to tackle two sides of these these problems. While RTC primarily is guaranteeing an availability across the year. Right. Obviously, the availability can vary from month to month as described in the tender. But RTC primarily focuses on availability, while FDRE uh, focuses on uh, following the requirement, right? If let's say, if uh, for example, for me, uh, hypothetically, if uh, because uh, for a for a steel plant, uh, there will be a, uh, multiple variable loads as well, apart from having a, uh, a static uh, base load also. So my kind of FDRE would be something which is a mix of RTC, which is guaranteeing me almost 60, 70 percent of base load power, plus also giving me a or let's say a uh, adequate ramp up ramp down uh, requirement maybe a seasonal requirement primarily uh, which will classify this as an fdre so fdre as the name speaks it's firm and dispatchable so whenever it is required uh, the power can be dispatched so now we are going uh, closer to the conventional power sources uh, right uh, till date yes we were focusing on bringing the cost downs adding the right scales but with FDRE, we are actually getting more and more closer uh, to the conventional power plants. Great, Hal. And I think uh, I would love to know more about your understanding of the FDRE tenders that have been launched recently. Uh, how? What do you think about the rates that have been uh, discovered? Is that something that will sustain going forward? Do you think that has a potential to replace uh, conventional generation? Right, right. I think a uh, very valid point, uh, Arjun. And uh, so I have been on the on both the sides. Right now, I'm a consumer, uh, and earlier I was a generator. Right, so I can understand both sides of the coin. But uh, see, fact of the matter is, and I think Anand can uh, vouch to that. When uh, uh, Mr. Modi started the entire solar, uh, uh, let's say uh, the, the solar journey, Gujarat was giving us a tariff of almost fifteen rupees uh, in the initial twelve years. Right, uh, and uh, at that point of time. Uh, it it was a fancy uh, you can say fancy technology to have solar, right? But with that fifteen rupees, uh, what he did was to create almost a gigawatt of scale, which was unheard of at that point of time. And with that one gigawatt, the ecosystem got developed, and then uh, ultimately now we are we are seeing the solar as one of the cheapest source of uh, power. Same thing is happening uh, with FDRE again. Uh, whatever said and done, uh, simply adding capacities blindly see. FDRE as a, as a concept was always there, uh, right? Earlier, it was being managed by the discoms themselves. Now, the bait has been passed on to the developers, right? Earlier, it was, let's say, they were they were doing the entire planning. They were uh, sourcing wind, solar separately. Uh, obviously, there was no storage at that point of time. So, they were trying to merge it with hydro and thermal power and try to make that work. Now, that bait has been passed on to the developers. So, it is more, uh, I would say, value additive uh, job. And the entire costing of that flexibility needs to be added on uh, while uh, seeing the while comparing the uh, rates. So uh, uh, let's say a long answer to a short question, but uh, if to if I have to summarize, uh, FDRE definitely is uh, something uh, which is uh, here to stay. Only thing is, yes, it needs a, a lot more development work, assessing the demand uh, correctly from the discounts, and then forming uh, the right uh, tender conditions. 
and uh, i think i am not too worried about the ten, uh, about the tariffs because uh, we have seen that and uh, with the falling the storage prices now uh, this is going to be uh, more, more more and more cheaper now going forward right. one last question i promised to you is that are the days for plain vanilla solar and wind generators done and this is open for all if i can raise your hand i can unmute you guys but yeah last question for you before i move on do you think we'll see more plain vanilla solar or wind? Is it only going to be more and more of RTC and FDRE? So maybe if I can uh, answer that and maybe others can uh, follow. Uh, my sense is that it will uh, coexist. Both will coexist. There are discounts which would like to uh, plan the entire things themselves. So they will obviously uh, continue to uh, source solar and wind separately. But there are discounts uh, which doesn't have let's say that strong uh, planning or uh, uh, don't want to uh, spend too much time on on that there uh, let's say a mix of rtc and fdre will uh, uh, exist so uh, yeah thank you Rahul. appreciate it uh, i'll uh, now move to uh, anand i think anand you're in a very interesting space right now there's so much happening on the consumer adoption side of uh, renewable energy I think about 14 gigawatts of commercial industry, 14 gigawatts of solar exists today under the same category. And then we have about 18 gigawatts under development under open access. And what's crazy is that I think about 40% of India's RE capacity uh, will actually come from consumer uh, driven growth, which is quite uh, surprising, I, I would say at least, and quite something I learned as well when I was doing the research here. And we're also seeing obviously that tariffs for these consumers continues to go up. Solar wind batteries continue to, to get cheaper as well. So uh, already like plain vanilla solar wind is happening for these consumers, but are you seeing that consumers at some point will move towards RTC and FDRE uh, to meet their entire quantum of demand from uh, renewable sources? Yes, yeah, so um, firstly on the potential, Arjun, yes, uh, we're seeing an inflection point now. Uh, and this whole, as I mentioned earlier, this lag for rooftop solar or distributed solar has, is pretty significant in India and is pretty well known which is something now getting plugged and uh, more and more uh, uh, commercial and industrial uh, enterprises are adopting and also residential side using the tech. Uh, so so uh, massive, uh, you know, uh, potential. And now every year, three to four gigawatts getting installed, but still, you know, we've just scratched the surface for distributed solar, right? And this has largely been driven by economics. You know, the value proposition for uh, industry is so massive. He's saving four rupees, five rupees, or six. Commercial guys save like more than ten rupees, twelve rupees. So uh, that's been driving uh, really the adoption of solar. Uh, we can't really say it's really the green thing uh, or green objective that is driving. It's really it's the economics and the incentive, economic incentive that's been driving the adoption. So when it comes to when you club it with the storage, what happens is the cost uh, goes up, right? Storage is still about you know, um, and I was talking to Ayush as well, is about seven, eight rupees. Per unit of cost is added. So solar, I would say, it costs about three, three and a half rupees versus nine rupees that our industry is paying. So that's pretty simple. What he would do is try and replace as much of his grid power using solar. When you add uh, storage, uh, that adds to the cost. So uh, for a more broader and uh, you know uh, massive uh, adoption with with storage, I think it's another two years away. Uh, the storage cost needs to come down maybe another 50 to 70, 80 percent. Uh, and that will happen for, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Having said that, uh, uh, storage plus solar do, does go in areas where there is less of grid, right? I mean, say in UP, Punjab, Bihar, there's grid outage for about five, six, seven years. Nighttime, there's no power. There it makes sense because then you're replacing DG, diesel gensets, right? So yeah, diesel costs you about 30, 40 rupees per unit. You know, uh, and it's a no-brainer because with storage would be about 10 rupees, 8 rupees, 10 rupees per unit, I mean, in diesel. So uh, it's clean power uh, and with storage, you save tons of money. So uh, which is where, where, where we're seeing now, like we started doing UP and UP, the, the, the hybrid systems are more in demand and it makes sense. So North India, yes, uh, uh, larger market, but if you come to Gujarat, Maharashtra, Southern states, yeah, less so. Uh, but another two years, and uh, we'll see that storage prices will keep coming down. I've seen that with storage, right? I mean, that was uh, the first uh, plant I signed up was 15 rupees I was getting. So, uh, you know, and, and it's now today is two and a half rupees. So, and that's largely driven by cost compression on the 
on the on the system cost. Uh, same thing with with large scale. Uh, I mean, we seeing that there's already over capacity on the storage side, and that uh, bringing the cost down. So uh, we will uh, we will see a much bigger uh, uh, play for uh, hybrid systems, and that's what we're reading at Aram for. Like we get so building this capacity and system. See, one of the bottlenecks we so see is that there is no monitoring platform, right? For hybrid, you have like an independent just solar monitoring platform, but with storage, there's nothing. So, which is what we're building. And then we're building financing ability to finance these hybrid systems because standalone solar, I have confidence in the technology and I can take risk. But when it comes to storage, I mean, still some, you know, early days for batteries. So, we've done financing a few systems here, and, and but we building the policies and systems here. So, sort of to finance those hybrid uh, projects. So yeah, that's that's my view. Thank you, Anna. I think that's a good segue for us to start talking about battery storage, given how important that is. And I think my first question will be for Ayush. So I think Ayush, again, the context is set. RTC, FDR, you are going to uh, keep rising. And obviously, the key element of this is going to be battery storage or energy storage in general. And what we're seeing is that tenders apparently for battery storage or grid scale storage, sorry, is going up. Majority of the tenders for storage today is from Hydro, I think so. And I think we're looking at about 30, 35 gigawatts of uh, storage tenders that have been, uh, you know, uh, sort of floated in 2023 alone. So with this being said, things are moving on the ground, but do you think we are on track to meet our 2030 goals with the current storage deployment and what's projected? And if not, how do we really get to be on track for, you know, getting storage off the ground quickly? Uh, thanks, Arjun. So, um, so if you look at, at a macro level in terms of planning, uh, what we have kind of uh, planned as per the capacity addition. So I was reading a report by CEA and they've done a detailed study on, uh, you know, the, the demand of like based on the growth, uh, the type of energy resources that we will have in 2030. And they, then they've tried to model the amount of storage given a certain cost trend uh, would be required at 2030. And they've come up with a number around like 200 gigawatt hour. So, the, so that's, that's kind of where based on their report, like we have to be by 2030. Uh, Today on the Indian grid, we are at about 200 megawatt hour, round about that number. So we have a thousand X journey to go from 200 megawatt hour to 200 gigawatt hour over the course of the next six years, uh, essentially. Now, any project which is bid out typically has a implementation cycle of 18 to 24 months, right? So. If I have like, let's say 30 gigawatts, gigawatt hour of projects announced this year, they will all come up in 20, 25, 26 uh, and further. So we really need to step on the gas in terms of storage deployment, whether it's coming through FDRE, whether it's coming through standalone storage. At the end of the day, like electricity grid is a machine. You require some buffer to be there in the, in the system. Um, the good news is I think that they found a few templates or models where, which I think they can replicate and, uh, implement rather quickly. So if you look at the solar deployment also, right? Like once solar prices fell below, uh, the cost that uh, of average procurement for a distribution company, uh, the ramping up of solar in terms of the number of tenders that came out, like really uh, sped up. And like, I think the same thing is going to happen with storage as well. If you look at the, the values of storage that have come out in the latest GUVNL, uh, standalone tender at a gigawatt hour scale, those numbers are very compelling. Right? And, uh, I think everyone in the value chain is, is in the positive, which is a good sign. Uh, and I think that there is a sustainable model to be had there. And now it is just a matter of how quickly can we sort of uh, replicate that model and build up the capacity. That's an implementation execution uh, challenge that I see uh, that we have to kind of work towards. Got it. Got it. You're saying that the, if the economics start to make sense, deployment shouldn't be a concern, just like how it worked in solar. Exactly. It, now, it's. I, I think the economics have started making sense this year, right? Like this is actually the first year where 
the the levelized cost of storage that has been identified from tenders is uh, have been at a value where everyone in the chain right from the utility to the developer everybody is able to make sufficient money so that ecosystem or that template of tendering is now sustainable now it's a matter of how quickly can we actually roll out more of these uh, and kick start the entire thing. as i said like ultimately the goal is this 1000x journey that we have to do right uh, so yeah we just okay. need to speed up the execution great thank you for that ayush i think i'll go on to uh, deb next again related question for you as well as i mentioned a lot of the tenders so far looks like they are uh, sort of for pump hydro uh, but best is also picking up so first of all let's understand the differences between a pumped hydro system and a lithium ion battery pack system what are the differences uh, why are they both you think there's space for both of them in the indian uh, storage ecosystem um so is that Wait. for me so demalia demalia sorry right. you're on mute deb you're on mute <laughs> go ahead i should want yeah. to answer that yeah as for you <laughs> okay yeah. so uh, first foremost uh, i don't think pumped hydro has been the majority of tenders in terms of capacity yes because it's always 12 gigawatt hour 16 gigawatt hour so that way yes but to esp specific tenders has not been that much specifically if you talk about this year it has been so till date we have 19 tenders which have come out out of which psp specific is just four okay the rest are uh, somewhat agnostic which are the fdr tenders and battery specific just batteries is just 10 one more coming out from kerala very soon so 11 so it's it's that way that the market is today now is it only psp or only batteries both are required i don't know why we kind of start making them compete each other they don't compete the use cases are very different and i give you two examples one is from china the other is from australia the concept of 100% rtc the way they are doing it today is renewables plus pumped hydro plus batteries and together an asset is being gear getting formed and i i i don't have the load curves i if i show you the load curve and the amount of accuracy they are getting in matching that load curve is amazing right so i think you know today if you look into the duration of storage today the duration of storage that is required is not of 6 hours of 8 hours okay the duration of storage today is in the in the range of 2 to 4 hours maybe and that is why you find lithium ion taking up the market because that is where lithium ion is a master but going forward even ce projects that the duration of storage by 2030 20, will be 5 hours okay so that is a space where there are multiple other contenders who will start competing with a lithium ion does pumped hydro not compete with a lithium ion in this space it does and we have seen pumped hydro having better tariffs than lithium ion but that was the two years back the tariffs were discovered today it will be difficult okay but yes pumped hydro has a bigger role to play but in in the term when you need lots of storage for a long long duration in the 6 hours 8 hour duration that is where pumped hydro offers beautiful tariffs and that is where batteries will not be able to compete with pumped hydro much right so i think both are required it's not one person as and and someone said that that it's not one technology which will solve you this game you will need multiple of these technologies together um yeah i think the the one question they that a lot of people have on their minds is economics right like economics so batteries is something that we are, we are seeing a drop in battery prices which we don't know if it's temporary whether it's going to continue this way as well and that determines a lot of what happens next as i just mentioned we are trying to we are close to that point where we might have uh, crossed the point where you know batteries are making sense are you seeing trajectories for batteries and pump hydro to uh reduce further and would that help the sector move quickly towards this 1000x target that i just mentioned so tariffs will fall uh but the rate at which it will fall for pumped hydro will be lesser because it's a much mature technology there are new forms of pumped hydro which they call today as novel pumped hydro which is coming up but the decrease in tariff in that area will not be as uh in the learning rate as we are seeing in batteries now for batteries it's 
also to a lot to do with how EVs perform in this market, specifically when we talk about uh, lithium ion batteries, right? So the drop today that you see, a lot of that is attributed to the global oversupply that is happening in the market, which in the near term doesn't look to you know fade out until something drastic happens, right? So that means the battery prices will keep falling. If you took to take today's cost, a pumped hydro comes in between 3.5 to 5 crores per megawatt. Okay. This number is not expected to change drastically going forward. But for batteries yeah. today, Ayush will give you the better numbers, but uh, the batteries today is around 160 to $180 per kilowatt hour. Now, why is this significant? This number was almost 250 or 260 even eight months back, not even a year back. That has been the drop. The cell cost that itself has fallen by 45%. Okay, if you go to China and ask LFP prices today at cell level, it's it has drastically fallen down. So much so that level, tier two, tier three level players are selling at negative margins, which which talks a lot about this market. Oh, right. Glad. So cost yeah. will decrease for for both, but it will not be a competition because batteries, of course, being a new tech, will see yeah. favorable, more drops. Great. And again, a, a question related to that is, we are also seeing newer technologies come up, right? Sodium ions now commercially being manufactured in China. Iron air, flow batteries are also being spoken about as well. Do you see a role for these technologies? And do you see that at India will require these technologies as we go forward? Absolutely. Uh, two of these which are making much more sense today are sodium ion and flow batteries, right? Uh, today, of course, you, again, the thing is you are competing with someone who is already at economies of scale, has already achieved it. So what we see is by the end of this decade towards 28, 29 is where sodium ion can make a mark. It also comes from the fact that sodium ion is not only restricted to stationary storage, but it also finds application in lower range EVs. So you, you have a better cost economics working for sodium ion against a flow battery, which is only for stationary storage. Now a flow battery will also compete in that genre with pumped hydro, right? So the competition becomes tough for him. So. Right. But saying that, I see flow batteries and sodium ion as the next two uh, who can compete in this market, specifically stationary storage. You also have others, gravity storage, iron air, others, but uh, at least not in this decade. Great. Thanks, Dev. We'll wait for 2030 and see how it works out. But yeah, I'll uh, move to uh, Rashad. And Rashad, I would love to hear from you on the topic of battery storage, there's so much innovation happening in the space globally as well uh, with new chemistries, technologies and whatnot. You're the closest to the ecosystem of startups, uh, not just in India, but also globally. Are you seeing this uh, space uh, sort of heating up both again globally and in India? And uh, if not, what really needs to change to really drive innovation in this sector? You're on mute again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, look, uh, as I said at the start, super excited about it. And uh, um, you all are much more knowledgeable about the specifics in India, but uh, I'll say from a third derivative and uh, uh, perspective, I think, you know, when we, we think about um, market potential, there are a couple of sort of figures that are really, really important. And we've spoken about the first of these, which is just, um, what peak load is ultimately going to look like. Um, the other thing in the context of energy storage that really matters is the ratio of, of energy storage to peak load eventually, which is a function of many things. But if you're simplifying, um, you know, that's, that's driven by the diversity of your, uh, you know, your renewable or your primary power resources um, and the uh, their, their variability over different time scales. And when you put those two things together, you know, the overall size of anticipated peak load and then the ratio between storage requirements and peak load, there is no more bigger, more exciting market in the world. Um, um, you know, 
in in India, I think you, there are various estimates out, out there, but I think the one that we anchor on is is a 24-hour storage requirement, some, something in the region of 155 uh, gigawatts, and a 100-hour, so actually a sort of uh, almost a, a, and that's truly long duration, uh, energy storage requirement somewhere in the region of, of 90 to, to 100. Um, and I think the Malia made, made this point. Right now, just given where renewables penetrations are, the priority in the premium is on the shorter durations. And as those variable renewable penetrations increase, you're going to shift to uh, a much, much greater need for those medium and long durations. So that's you know size of, of, of the market. And then when you look at the, that ratio of storage requirements to peak load, you're talking about uh, something in excess of uh, 33, 34% in India ultimately in, in 2050. Um, and that's because wind, which is obviously a, going to be a pretty significant part of the mix, is, is, has very, very high seasonable variability. Now, there are other big markets out there like the US where uh, you know, the numbers are big, but there's such a, a large diversity of, of resources um, and less seasonality with the wind, so that that ratio is lower. Brazil has a lot of, you know, again, massive overall need, but a lot of hydropower. India is really unique in this combination of, of both. And that's ultimately, I think, what makes the, the market so, so exciting. Um, when we think about in, innovation, um, the way the sort of taxonomy that I think about or that we think about is uh, electrochemical approaches, which include uh, obviously lithium ion, but also novel electrochemical. And, uh, you know, the, um, and that includes sodium alternatives, it includes novel lithium, certainly sodium ion, uh, zinc based, uh, which is, I think, an area that we're really excited about. In fact, one of the company, our portfolio companies that I'm most ex excited about is, is an Indian company uh, with a zinc gel solution called the Off Grid um, Energy Labs, actually now looking, thinking about market expansion into the West, into, into the US. And um, there's absolutely no reason in the world they cannot penetrate some of the most competitive battery energy storage markets in the world. Uh, so particularly excited about them. So there's there these novel electrochemical approaches. Uh, there are the other sort of category in here, obviously, are the flow battery systems. And redox flow is, uh, um, is, I think, you know, what people immediately jump to when they think about flow battery systems. Uh, but there are the sort of variants that are that are vanadium redox flow is typically what people think. But there are others that we are again uh, really really excited about zinc air sort of being uh, one of them, and these new novel organic electrolytes. And the reason we're so excited is because those are where we see the biggest cost reduction potential on a per kilowatt hour or a combination of a per kilowatt hour or round, and round trip efficiency basis. So that's all electrochemical. We think that mechanical storage solutions have a really, really important role to play. Uh, we've talked about pump hydro, but there are others. Uh, compressed air, compressed gases, compressed CO2 in particular, liquefied gases, where you're essentially um, um, all of which have bring really, really interesting thermodynamic properties. These are quite often, in the case of something like carbon dioxide, really, really simple, easy gases to work with. Building uh, the company in our portfolio that I think is best representative of this is, is Energy Dome, which is building some of the largest stationary um, um, storage applications in, in the world right now. So again, uh, you know, Mecha this set of mechanical storage solutions, something that we're very ex excited about and seeing a lot of promising innovation in. And then the last category are thermal storage. And thermal storage is interesting because of the hybrid or dual applications, uh, the ability to provide industrial heat, uh, sometimes at really, really high temperatures, in addition to playing this really critical role for, uh, for the power sector. 
Um, and that includes a variety of approaches. Again, sort of solid um, batteries that are essentially dealing with sensible heat or, or sensible load. Uh, and then thermochemical approaches where you have essentially a reversible chemical reaction. And I think there are really, really exciting innovations happening in each and all of those areas. We're starting to see, and I, you know, I mentioned one company, some of that innovation bubble up in, in India. Uh, and I think, again, again, coming back to my original point, if you just look at the market fundamentals, there is no more promising uh, market in the world. There's no market in the world where that combination of latent demand and, uh, and that high ratio of storage requirements to that latent demand is, yeah, is bigger, is more promising. Thank you, Shah. That's really helpful. I'm glad you, uh, you're you looking at chemistries beyond just the conventional ones right now. Um, uh, my question also, Vatsal, I think, uh, Vatsal, uh, you represent Avana. Uh, Avana has been very active in this space, both renewable energy battery storage. So uh, as, as, a, as a VC firm, what is Avana's strategy in, the, in this energy transition space, especially in the renewable energy and battery sector in India? Yeah. So actually, uh, actually, Avana is very, very excited about the entire opportunity. Like uh, what we do essentially is we provide risk capital and expect large outcomes. Uh, different VCs will take different kinds of risks. We typically do not take technology risks, but beyond that. Uh, and what you said around the need to go 1000x from here, what Dimala said about crashing lithium prices, what Rusha said about newer technologies, innovative technologies, uh, both electrochemical, mechanical, thermal coming up. I think all of this screams large market opportunity. And, and, and so we believe that there will be large outcomes and hence which uh, excites us about the space a lot. Uh, Avana's strategy like in general investments is to actually back great founders and help them succeed. And uh, obviously backing great founders mean providing the capital uh, and the access. I think the second piece of uh, helping them succeed is fairly crucial in the energy transition space particularly. And, and by helping them succeed, what I mean is to provide them the strategic guidance they require, opening up the right networks for them, and essentially unlocking for the capital. Because this is a very heated market as well. And this is a market where you already have large incumbents also trying to make a debt. So guidance in the strategy makeup is very, very important. And what we are looking in terms of the kind of opportunities we want to back, or the kind of founders we want to back are essentially, obviously there should be a, a technology advantage either around a very novel technology per se or an approach towards solving a particular problem. Uh, but also we will want to uh, back founders who are solution oriented and essentially think about the GTM and figure out the GTM in this way. Because there is always a right time. And while we have a longer view of five to eight to 10 years to actually uh, create large outcomes in that period, there is obviously right strategy required to, to build a large business out of it and not get distracted. So I think, we definitely believe that there is a large opportunity which will get created and uh, we have the right tailwinds around it across the uh, and there are opportunities across the value chain while obviously uh, cell manufacturing and module manufacturing is essentially taken up by China and it will be hard to compete uh, on that front but we still believe in a longer horizon I think with newer chemistries coming in there is obviously a opportunity across the value chain starting from cell design uh, module manufacturing, assembly, integration, ONM, and essentially eventually recycling. So while lithium value chain has been captured at the front end of it, but for newer chemistries like sodium and iron, still there. So uh, we're actively scouting. Uh, the regulatory tailwinds, the market opportunity is all there, but huh, we're looking for great teams in this space because it's also going to be very competitive. It's going to be very heated. So that's how we're thinking about this. Great. Thank you, Vatsal. Uh, really uh, exciting to hear your strategy there. Uh, we are just on the one hour mark right now. So I think we're now going to talk about what are the current trends, what are the kind of policy regulatory requirements and all that exciting stuff. So um, let's start with another very interesting uh, situation we are at right now in the middle of. So the two very interesting trends happening in the space today. Uh, one is this, this massive glut of global manufacturing for both solar panels, cells, battery storage, uh, so much so that there's ample amount of uh, uh, supply and then there's just not sufficient demand uh, at the moment, which is 
uh, helping drive down the costs uh, rather quickly as well. That's the one trend which everyone talks about. And the other trend which also is uh, emerging is the fact that India, along with many other countries, are also trying to shore up manufacturing of these components through PLI schemes, through the IRA in the US, and when Europe is thinking of something of this nature, imposing DCR, imposing import duties and tariffs as well. Now, uh, these uh, two trends are technically on two opposite poles uh, within a spectrum. So I'd like to know from all the panelists that what are the shorter term and longer term implications of these trends for India's RTC and uh, battery storage sectors? And again, I'll uh, start with Vaishnavi first for this and you know go around the table uh, and ask this question. So thank you, Arjun. I think, you know, at the very start of this uh, panel, you had mentioned that the rate at which the capacity addition for renewables needs to happen in India, uh, you know, there is still some ramping up that is expected uh, for us to be able to meet our commitments. And when you juxtapose that with, you know, everything that is happening within the Indian ecosystem, what we realize that module manufacturing capacity is not the real bottleneck. It is, in fact, cell manufacturing where we are facing a challenge and also for batteries. Uh, now, when you look at the value chain, you need, uh, there is a dependency on the raw materials. So when you're talking about lithium, cobalt, nickel, these are not something that is available in plenty within the Indian ecosystem. And therefore, being able to ramp up these, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing capacities in India will continue to have some kind of an import dependence. Uh, and that's where the real challenge lies. Um, there is a drop in price from the international markets and therefore imports are always um, even right now, more competitive than, you know, what has been manufactured in India. And in the short term, therefore, that uh, dichotomy of, uh, you know, the dependence on the, uh, you know, imports will continue to remain. However, when you extrapolate this to the long term, I think there is uh, uh, positive trends that are being seen uh, from a manufacturing capability, from uh, creating uh, alternatives uh, for the supply chain, etc., and uh, it is uh, something that will be absolutely critical for us to um, de, uh, you know, tangle when we go forward. Uh, so in the short term, I think there will be continuing dependence on imports because of the dropping prices and the kind of capacity that needs to be added. Uh, whereas in the long term, I think there will be a little bit of a settling in, in, in terms of the manufacturing capacity that we are seeing. Because there is, with all the government incentives that are happening and with all the players who are coming in, uh, to uh, you know, grab these opportunities, there is likely to be increase in manufacturing capacity. Uh, I can't hear you, Arjun. You're on mute. Yeah, it's, it's my, it's my. So yeah, thanks for the lot, lot for the question. Really helpful to know what, uh, how you guys are tackling it. Rahul, over to you. You also have a similar sort of opinion on this, or do you have anything to add? Uh... To that? Something similar uh, what Vaishnavi said, I would just like to add on to one other thing is that, uh, see, blindly uh, showing the capacities, manufacturing capacities, just uh, trying to protect the domestic industry uh, blindly also may not help. I think uh, where we are really lacking is uh, investment at the R&D st uh, stage, right? Uh, uh, let's say if lithium ion uh, can work for China or, or Europe, uh, you have seen EVs while there have been a lot of uh, noise around it in India, uh, EVs are primarily restricted to three-wheelers or two-wheelers uh, in India. We are not seeing that much uh, penetration of four-wheelers EVs uh, in India, which is happening uh, globally. So obviously the requirement need is very different. And uh, that's what, uh, let's say, the, the incentivization uh, should be working on. I think that's the limited point. Uh, as of now, what we are doing is we are, we are trying to uh, create an artificial barrier uh, where we are actually, while yes, in the short term, we are definitely losing out, obviously in terms of higher tariffs uh, and higher, uh, let's say, energy is the input for other industries. Uh, so we are actually increasing uh, overall, uh, uh, in a broader sense, inflation uh, to that sense. But yes, uh, I think uh, technology is something where uh, I still am not seeing a lot of uh, focus on. And that's that's what I think we should be focusing on as an as Indian uh, uh, domestic market. Understood. Yeah. Thanks for that. A quick question for both you and Vaishnavi is that is it today cheaper? Is still cheaper to import panels from China, slap the duties on them as compared to buying panels in India, or are they more or less on the same page? Plus. Sorry. It is. I think still cheaper to import. 
Wow. Okay. So long much, long. much cheaper, I would say. <laughs> Not to be complacent about it, but yes, uh, definitely it's. And see, as Vaishnavi rightly rightly pointed out, uh, it's not the module capacity. Uh, which is an issue. It's the, uh, let's say, the uh, wafer capacity, cell capacity, polysilicon capacity way, which is driving up the prices, right? If I'm China, I'll just uh, quickly, uh, let's say, uh, cull, it, cull the entire polysilicon capacity down and artificially inflate uh, my margins. Uh, India is completely dependent on that. Okay, great. Um, that's uh, good to hear. Uh, same question for you, uh, Anand. Anything to add to that? Do you see that being a challenge for your uh, where you're sitting, and you know how, how things are on your side? You're on mute. It seems to be happening quite a lot. Sorry, uh, you had two two questions, right? Two parts. Two. One was uh, the glut in the on the supply side and manufacturing is leading to continuous fall in prices. Uh, my view is that tech is absolutely great for the space. Uh, and uh, I just draw from the experience in on solar PV. Uh, we've seen these cluts like I've seen it in 10, 15 years, five, six times, right? I mean, there's a glut that gets created, the prices crash, right? And then the demand comes up again and the, the capacity gets, the utilization starts to happen more, but the price never goes, goes up, right? I mean, it's kind of a ratchet effect. So the falling price is definitely great for the space and it's inevitable that solar and storage will have to go together. The intermittent, the fundamental flaw uh, of, of renewable power is the infirmness, right? Or, or the intermittency. So this, along with storage, it has to work. Uh, so, uh, and the falling costs, uh, which is what I beginning, beginning said, like if another 50, 60 or 80% fall in storage would, would be great, where uh, with storage and solar, it's about three rupees in India, then that's when it looks sexy and just amazing for everyone to adopt. And the models for utilities will be disrupted like forever. I mean, because the beauty of solar and storage is its uh, ability, being modular in its ability to generate distributed right, on, on site and consume on site. And, and that's what the world will move towards. And the redundancy of transmission and distribution infrastructure or sort of large plants sort of. So, so I mean, that's more like a, well, 10, 15 years out. But I'm saying uh, that's the beauty and, and the solar and storage go well together. So falling prices and costs is amazing and continue, will continue to happen. And that will disrupt and transform the space uh, more and more as we go along. Uh, in terms of uh, duties and uh, all of the policies that have been brought in picture, I'm not sure if they're really doing the right things. I mean, I, I, I'm on the other side of the debate because as Rahul said, like it, you are artificially showing up the cost overall for the economy. Like, India, today an industry pays nine rupees using coal power, right? And and that's the cost of generating coal and transmitting and distributing it to a SME. Why has India's industry been called less competitive vis-a-vis -vis China? One of the reasons is cost of power. So you had this amazing opportunity to bring down the overall cost to three rupees for everyone. How do you care where the modules are? Let, let it come from China. Let them cross-subsidize your power. Like you import these high quality modules that are manufactured in China and this one time investment for 25 years and bring down the overall cost of energy. I mean, I try, I write, I wrote something down. I sent it to, uh, sent it uh, to the ministry as well. I mean, a couple of years back, but you know, uh, that's my view. I mean, the, you're putting artificial duties. We're going back to 1950s, Mahala Nobis era, right? Import substitution days where we brought down the, you know, you, you know, these are artificial uh, barriers that are being created. Uh, so that's my, my view. I mean, it, I'm not sure how much it will work. China just is mammoth. It controls 90% of the manufacturing capacities. Every every month it adds up, <laughs> I think, capacities as India does it like uh, in maybe a few years. So so uh, as Rahul said, investment in R&D R &D and then thinking differently, right? Uh, thinking whole end-to-end -end ecosystem infrastructure together uh, will have to be brought up uh, and could be done through PLI way, the, the whole the duty stuff, the DCR stuff. I mean, all the DCR, I mean, do you think like the, uh, the, the, the prime minister's program, the rooftops that will come up, subsidize the uh, rooftops in the PM Surya car, what do you think the quality of stuff that will come up there? I mean, I don't want to go there, but uh, you know, it's just a question mark. Uh, uh, so people are just trying to get subsidies, put up mod uh, systems and uh, you know, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, as jury is still out whether in these policies really will benefit the program. I mean, in the short term, yeah, it, it's giving more profits to manufacturers. 
but over a long term, I think uh, it's retrograde and uh, uh, better to uh, keep it. I mean, you could have uh, defendable duties, not 40, 50 percent and DCR and all kinds of artificial barriers. It's not even tariff, there are non-tariff barriers also put in place. So we've seen that like because before uh, 21, 22, the plant cost was uh, about 35 rupees. I'm not talking about and then the duties came, the plant cost went to 55 rupees per watt. I've seen that when we were financing. Then they were again fallen, but the beauty of the technology is the cost of fallen again to 35, even with duties. So, uh, but without duty, it will come down to 25 rupees per, uh, per watt, right? So, uh, uh, that's why, so falling costs great and it will continue to happen. You can't just uh, defy, go against the fundamentals. Uh, so it will continue to drive adoption of uh, solar and then high, and, and hybrid systems going forward. Uh, Policy-wise, we need to do better and think better. Uh, it has to be a more holistic and thoughtful solution. I've spoken to some of the policymakers around, but you guys are better placed. Uh, maybe RMI and uh, Demale, all of you guys to uh, make sense and probably get better, better at it. So yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Anand. Um, going to Ayush quickly on this as well. So Ayush, I think this, your question will be a little more targeted because it's more on batteries and batteries manufacturing is very nascent. Cells, I believe, hardly any manufacturing happens in India. So is this a check concern for India's clean energy goals to A, uh, not have any manufacturing capacity in India and be so dependent on, a, on countries outside of India for our cells and battery manufacturing? Um, so uh, I think uh, I'd like to like sort of deconstruct that question into two parts, right? So there is one part which is around the demand side. Um, and by demand, what I mean to say is basically developers who are asset owners in India, right? Like for example, they are the ones who are buying uh, equipment. Now these developers are typically uh, businesses, private equity, institutional funded enterprises they will buy whatever is the best techno commercial product that is available. They do not buy based on which nationality like the panel is or cell is manufactured, right? To meet the energy transition goals um, and to meet it in the best economically, uh, you know, sort of the best way, uh, these developers should be allowed to basically buy uh, irrespective of country, nationality, all of it. So there should be no distortion over there on the demand side. That is, I think that is kind of the opinion which everyone on the panel has also echoed uh, so far. So primary goal is to meet the energy transition at the lowest possible cost, in which case like you should be allowed to basically buy from wherever, whoever is providing the best technical, techno commercial solution that is available. Now, the second aspect is the supply side. Now, energy transition by itself is a is an amazing opportunity, right? As a nation, like we are doing so much capacity building, I view this as an economic opportunity for businesses to kind of build towards. And that is the opportunity that we are trying to capture uh, as a nation, whether it's in solar panels, whether it's in batteries, there's a lot of like domestic demand, global demand, uh, and so on that is available. But to capture this, you are really competing with the globe. You're not competing just with uh, Indian uh, sort of businesses. Uh, when a module manufacturer or cell manufacturer is building large capacities in China, their, their pricing is lower unless you match them on their pricing, right? Uh, you may have like, let's say a year or two years of duties and so on, but you're fundamentally not competitive uh, at all on, on the long, longer time frame against them. And you have to compete. It's a very global world in general. Uh, so now how do you create uh, local capability for businesses in India, given that you have this opportunity that is available? And I think there is a pragmatic approach to building out this capability. The first thing we have to do is, if China is building 100 gigawatt hour of cell capacity, whether it's on the solar or the uh, uh, or the battery side, can we be smart buyers, right? Like just buy uh, it in a proper manner. Uh, make sure that you are not fully dependent on them. You diversify maybe one or two uh, geographically. You know, some have a few buyers. For example, the US is also like sort of rolling out massive uh, incentives for uh, shoring up 
production capabilities the ira is nothing but like sort of you know massive tax incentives to to bring production back to the us now is there a smarter way to basically buy uh, you know through diversified sources that's one one way that we could do it without actually investing billions and billions of dollars into setting up capacity where we might not actually be competitive uh, so that's that's one aspect the second is what are we really strong at i feel like we are very strong at software we are really strong at designing uh, all the lower uh, capex high high skilled kind of uh, services or uh, or businesses i think we actually have a pretty strong value proposition to get embedded uh, into that global supply chain and i feel that that is an opportunity that is sort of like a low hanging fruit which we are not uh, tapping into and i feel the the incentives that we are uh, we are creating uh, are all from a policy perspective whether it's in the form of customs duty is not aligned with trying to incentivize those kinds of businesses i'll give you uh, one one last example right like for example in a energy storage system today there isn't much of a customs duty gap between whether i bring the full system or whether i bring a battery pack uh there is sure some benefit if you bring a cell like let's say a prismatic cell and then you build it out there's some small benefit uh that you get but the supply chain to build out everything is already available in india if you were to create a duty structure to incentivize uh local manufacturing you have to look at how you differentiate the duty between uh the cell level to what is actually available on the ground rather than placing a duty on the whole component in which case you are not you just show, sort of inflating all the cost so uh even arriving at the right duty structure is something that i feel is quite nuanced and requires a, a slightly more detailed study on the parts of the policy makers to to incentivize uh localized manufacturing that's the that's the goal great thank you ayush Really helpful. Uh, Dave, over to you. Anything to add to that? Thanks. Uh, you know, and we did the study last year to understand in this entire battery value chain who are the actual revenue creators and how can you actually find the benefit. Of course, manufacturing captures the biggest revenue creator, but what we forget is even if you start manufacturing cells in India, you are still not. you know kind of you are still left out with a lot of value which is there in the system which goes back to processing of these raw materials if you are not doing anything there you will never get an advantage because that is something where china has taken complete control on 90% of that is controlled by china right china is not a master in mining no what it has taken care is the processing part so no matter where you are mining your materials you have to go to china to process it and then come back with your cathodes and anodes and make your batteries in your country right so and this was a study done by benchmark minerals to see that if every country starts doing everything on their own domesticating everything then the cost of this energy transition will be off the roof and we will never be able to do this rather than that if we form these kind of collaborations that if you are good in something i can piggyback on that and something that i am good in i add it to it that is where this value creation comes in beautifully beautifully the second part is as you said that uh, is manufacturing required is india losing out on anything i don't think india is losing out on anything i would say that no one no one cares where is that it coming from right and we so we are hearing that even solar where today we are at least manufacturing we are not competitive battery we have not even started we have it's getting in process right by 27 28 something online will come up will be be competitive and we only compare ourselves with china right but we also forget that at that point of time us europe will also be manufacturing so we will also be competing with them so yeah i think it's it's more a collaborative effort rather than everyone trying to do it on their own Great, thanks a lot for that, Dev. Um, uh, Rushad, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, you guys are again a, a lot closer to this than I am, Arjun. I feel like you're maybe better positioned to, to answer the policy question than 
than maybe anyone. But uh, yeah, yeah. so this is what I I hear right from our portfolio companies and um, and the third derivative folks in India. And by the way, if you guys know don't know Alex Rutter, uh, he's the guy really to 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 speak to. But uh, yeah, I I think the maybe I'll start by just doubling down on on Anand's comment comment right because i think that's key like good energy regulatory systems use le least res uh, least cost resource planning or least cost resource adequacy planning um and and there needs to be a process by which you can sort of bundle together renewable energy and and energy storage to create clean firm power and compare it against coal directly and right now my understanding is coal is bid into the system based on this nomination system and renewable energy has to you know be tendered competitively uh that's not a level playing field um so you know that's the first and most obvious thing and you can you know pick your analogy right if you if you want to bet on the technology of the future which is what we're talking about then you you can't keep subsidizing effectively subsidizing and doubling down on the technology of the past right like imagine you're backing one cricket team uh but the team you're playing against you're you're you know encouraging them and letting them ball tamp or adopt the pitch or whatever you want right imagine you are trying to adopt a really healthy plant-based diet but then immediately after you finish your meal you're going not to sweeten <laughs> you know piling up your plate with junk like you know it it makes outside in it just it makes absolutely no sense and to Anand's point the downstream effects are really really profound profoundly deleterious right the Indian industrial competitiveness so that's the most I think obvious thing um the and there's all kinds I know there are all kinds of other things like direct and indirect subsidies as well coal imports exempt from basic customs duty and and solar and wind and storage we've been talking about this subject to all of these right um the other thing I think that could be really interesting is is the idea of some sort of aggregating uh entity that um you know packages that variable renewable energy together with storage as firm power takes that offer to discoms and I mean, it's clear based on the numbers that you all are seeing, that we all are seeing, that that represents massive potential savings. You know, you you would get, I think even LBNL's research suggested that if you do that, you're talking about sub, you know, five rupees per kilowatt hour compared to new coal that, you know, sitting over, over six. Um, and so, you know, these are some fairly obvious things. If you, again, um, Coming back to one of the original points that we talked about and that I made, this is the most promising market long term for advanced energy storage in the world. That represents the future. We should be anticipating and we should be figuring out a way to actually actualize that future. And current policies are frankly getting in the way and, and slowing things down. Um, so, you know, there's big picture, I think those are the most important things. In terms of actual R&D support for, you know, the types of companies that that uh, third derivative supports and that Avana invests in, uh, India has clearly shown that when we, when the country does direct R&D spending in the right way, uh, it can be a world leader, it can be globally competitive, you know, electrolyzer manufacturing, I think is a really, really good example of this. I suspect EVs, some sub segments will be an, another. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why um, it couldn't happen and shouldn't happen for, for energy storage. Great. Thank you, Rashad. And very quickly to WhatsApp again. Any of these trends that we spoke about, does it, does it impact uh, or does it create volatility for uh, Havana? Yeah, I think taking a step back, I think I agree with most of the panelists on the uh, and echo the same thing. I think there is no merit in playing a catch up uh, on the production side with China. And uh, uh, I believe in what Ayush said about being smart buyers and actually opening up further opportunities on the downstream processing, whether it's prioritizing the integration of uh, energy storage or 
working on end of life or different kind of innovations. And if you think about it, in Indian innovation has obviously leapfrogged. We leapfrogged the the broadband journey, went to mobile internet. We leapfrogged the uh, the credit card journey, went to UPI. And I think there is enough innovation possibilities and scope uh, beyond just thinking about lithium ion battery production uh, and cell production. To give you an example, I think for, at the fundamental technology level. It's a company uh, which reality currently essentially is trying to build uh, controllers which can actually control each and every cell in the module. So a module will get in thrown away if a few cells go bad and not and there but still uh, scope for them to store energy, but you can't use them today, uh, given that current technology. So can you create controllers and semiconductor chips around to actually control each and all those cells independently so that you can add models? So this is again a different kind of R and D which is going to happen. There is innovation on business model possible, for example, vehicle to grid. And the startups in India are trying to think about that and, and unlock a lot of storage energy, which is there in, say, electric buses or other electrifying uh, machines we have, robots we have, vehicles we have. So there is enough potential and, and opportunities beyond just playing catch up on the production side. And I think uh, that's where we should focus on. Uh, and if we focus the R&D efforts in the right direction, I think we might end up at a very different place versus just playing catch up. Great. Thank you, Vatsal. Appreciate it. Uh, so I think we we'll now quickly go into the, the requirements and the policy, regulatory and finance uh, for RTC and FDRE. So I think I'll start with you, Rahul, first. Is RTC and FDRE are quite new uh, in India right now. Uh, what is the current policy regulatory ecosystem like? And what do we really require in policies and regulations to really rapidly accelerate these two uh, technologies and models? Uh, sure. Thanks, Arjun. So, yeah. So, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, both these things are fairly new concept, and uh, in especially let's say inclusion of storage. Uh, in the initial few years, it was a mammoth task to include storage in the entire electricity regulatory framework. Uh, having said that, now I think we are in a position that yes, at least uh, uh, storage is being recognized as the third uh, important element uh, in that, apart from uh, consumer and generator. So, uh, see, but uh, having said that, there are still various uh, uh, gaps uh, which are there in the policy domain, which still needs to be filled up. Most of the other guys, like, for example, let's say the entire transmission, the, the entire GNA framework, right? While it does uh, account for uh, concepts like uh, hybrid, concepts like uh, uh, RTC uh, or uh, FDRE, uh, but there have been uh, flip and flops uh, in that in that domain as well, right? Uh, uh, if you recall, in, each, in the initial uh, uh, phase, uh, developers were allowed to get connectivities uh, according to their installed capacities. But uh, there were there were a lot of uh, uh, let's say tussle between the uh, load dispense centers, the CEA, uh, right, and, P and PGCIL. Uh, very recently, there have been uh, uh, new regulation which restricts uh, the connectivity to the uh, PK capacity. So effectively, in that sense, uh, the entire non-co-located or uh, the entire concept of FDRE, RTC, where we were uh, supposed to take the benefit of complementarity of wind profiles or uh, generation resources, that somehow gets uh, negated, uh, right? So we are pushed back on that sense. Uh, that is that is definitely uh, uh, again this is just one example point is that yes uh, a long term uh, framework needs to be uh, maintained here and, and then appropriate uh, let's say small bricks by brick uh, uh, changes can help in achieving uh, our desired output right so that is one uh, second thing is obviously uh, one thing which yes after a lot of push uh, from the industry uh, regulator included See, what is, if I ask you, what is our biggest uh, uh, flexibility source right now in the entire uh, electricity grid? It's actually merchant market, right? It is one of the cheapest and the biggest uh, storage uh, or flexibility, flexible asset, which we have. Uh, initially, if you recall, uh, there was no mention of uh, RTC was completely renewables. There was no uh, inclusion of uh, any storage or any merchant markets. Thankfully, in, in the latest uh, FDRE guidelines uh, also, uh, there was, let's say, 5% uh, merchant market got included, uh, right? Which effectively, uh, I still remember we were uh, during uh, the REMCL tender, the Railway Energy Management uh, tender, uh, it, uh, it was the first tender which recognized uh, the requirement of 5% uh, merchant market uh, requirement. And frankly, that, that uh, showed 
the the kind of uh, tariffs which were achieved in that uh, tender was phenomenal uh, for the, for the compliance levels that they wanted so this is something uh, which i think uh, maybe uh, god knows let's say if, if there could be a let's say public private uh, forum which can be created uh, to deliberate on uh, some of these things and especially the regulations can be formulated to address the exact uh, uh, issues uh, at hand right and everything has to be uh, on a long term basis uh, we can't uh, let's say the current stage at which we are we can't just solve for let's say next two years as a few uh, fellow panelists uh, stated uh, whatever uh, assets we are bidding right now it will come up uh, or let's say it will get operationalized after two two and a half years that too let's say uh, assuming uh, we don't have any grid issues right which again is a big big uh, uh, problem which we are facing uh, as an industry right now we don't have any clarity on uh, whether the timeline stated uh, on the evacuation front whether it will be uh, complied with or not so uh, we at least need to formulate a let's say five year plan uh, whenever we start so that at least two and a half three years of operational stuff uh, gets also included and then we have long term clarity uh, onto that so i think obviously there there's a long list of uh, changes that uh, as an industry we would require but uh, not to take let's say further time uh, these are let's say few inputs that i would like to uh, uh, give to give and uh, as a food of thought Great. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, Vashni, I would like to invite you next. Obviously, if you have any thoughts on what Rahul said and anything to add to that. But the larger question for you is, uh, in terms of the financing ecosystem, it's the lifeblood uh, of this sector. So um, is the financing ecosystem maturing for RTC and FTRE? And what is really required to then, if it's not on track, how do we really accelerate that to make sure that there's ample financing for this to scale? Yeah, so Arjun, I think, you know, I agree with what, uh, you know, Rahul had said. Just one thing to add to that, I think there's a need also to, to be able to develop the infrastructure that is report, uh, required to support the entire, uh, you know, ecosystem. So there needs to be a logistics network which kind of supports efficient manufacturing and distribution also. Um, uh, on the financing side, um, you know, it is yet uh, a nascent space. It is a very high capex uh, requirement, uh, you know, uh, project, and also the uh, returns are not very assured. So, therefore, I think there is a need for the entire ecosystem to come together from a public-private partnership standpoint, and uh, from the kind of uh, you know support that is uh, to be provided through policies uh, to be uh, able to develop this further. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, uh, and then the next question is for you. And this is actually one of the questions I've been looking forward to ask is that, uh, I mean, we personally also see that commercial industrial consumers have massive sort of uh, opportunity to adopt RE, but states uh, are restricting, a lot of states to restrict, restrict impose charges, duties on open access and uh, sometimes in net metering. Do you see this being a challenge for India's energy transition? And you know, what do you think is required to really move the needle on uh, on this for consumer adoption to really scale? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's been sort of a bit of a pet peeve uh, for folks, either on utility side or, uh, uh, or, or distributed side. I mean, I was thinking of my utility days. I mean, the biggest issues were yeah, uh, discoms wouldn't sign PPUs on time, or if you sign them, they wouldn't pay. I used to be in discoms office every week, like trying to get my payment, like which were like due for like 12 months, 18 months. So uh, coming to distributed, of course, like some of the states don't recognize net metering, or uh, from an open access standpoint, they use the open access charges as lever to sort of you know uh, stop sort of RE's rollout. Uh, but the beauty of India is also that it's like. Uh, 20 states or 20 countries. If, so you can go to so we play in states where it's conducive, right? And that gives us good enough, large enough business to build out. So that is one. I mean, so the there are states which, you know, uh, put barriers or sort of policy that are not conducive. Uh, but there are states where we can go and, and, and build the business. So uh, that, that's fine. And, and most of us have done over the last 10, 15 years to go to states which are more conducive. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think the way I think of this is that fundamentally the current undercurrent is for cleaner power, right? Uh, and then the world is cap capping coal and, and and fossil fuels. So there is no way for uh, most of these other states, which 
are creating barriers in terms of uh, any of these net metering, uh, not having net metering or gross metering is, is kind of not, not good for uh, rooftops or all these open access charges, they will have to fall in line. Uh, I mean, at one end, we have like 500 gigawatt target of that say 30, 40% is distributed. How do you how do you expect to uh, meet all of these? It has so the the governments or the discoms will need to step in um, to to do that, and and that's the fundamental premise we work with. Otherwise, it will be tough to build businesses, right? If you don't, <laughs> because you know that the, fundamentally the solar uh, solar is cheap, and and then the, there is mass, massive tailwinds in favor of uh, you know clean energy. So that's what we work with, and. Uh, and we and and we've been right, right? That's what it's it's been growing. I mean, there are states that really promote that. Uh, and uh, say, for example, Maharashtra, it allows open access for even more larger capacities, right? Get net metering and all of that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty optimistic on that front. Uh, uh, other states which are lagging, they'll fall in line. Um, and and because there'll also be pressure from consumers to sort of open up some of these, uh, you know, uh, options for them. So, and also regulations wise, I mean, the energy uh, electricity act that's been on the table for a long time where you, you know, uh, separate infra ownership and, and the content, um, you know, uh, there are political undercurrents and this committee is not able to do it, but if that happens, I mean, so, so these things really push further, uh, the renewable, uh, share. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll quickly move on to batteries now. So I think they have obviously the uh, the regulatory ecosystem and policy for batteries is evolving. It's still, I would say, in the stage of, uh, it's still to mature. But are we on track in terms of policies, regulations? Do we require better policies and regulations to move the battery sector forward? Um, so see, in the policy and regulatory part, things have been done. Okay, I won't say things have not been done. Is they perfect? No, they are not perfect. They need to evolve too. But things have been done and not only on demand perspective, but also on supply. Okay, uh, but just giving an example, like the VGF scheme we launched, right? It's for 4 gigawatt hour capacity. The requirement is 47 gigawatt. 47 gigawatt into 5 hours to 208 gigawatt hours by 2030, right? So it's huge. Now, there, if you remember, there was a concept paper which was floated earlier this year where they said that there will be state-specific VGF coming out, okay? The, because this VGF was only for center. There will be state-specific VGF scheme for standalone storage which will come out. Also, uh, mandatory storage participation in all renewable tenders. In the energy storage framework which came out in 2022, uh, it said 5% participation. Now, 5% is nothing. It's nothing. It, it, would, it won't be of any use. Today, uh, if you look into China, the mandate is 25% for every renewable tender. There is a discussion going on to increase that 5% to around 15% and then slowly increase it over time. Okay. But what my point here is that this area is so much evolving. The technical parameters, efficiency parameters, etc., is evolving. So guidelines, which were appropriately made two years back, is no longer appropriate today. So these guidelines, the, the tender guidelines, everything needs to evolve over time. What you did two years back may not be, uh, you know, appropriate today. They also need to evolve over time. 12 years PPA contract for a standalone storage looked beautiful two years back. Today, there is a question on it. Is 12 years enough? Can we increase that? So these, are, and then the problem that happens is we blindly copy paste tenders. One tender worked, chalo, copy karte rao. So <laughs> that is a bigger problem, okay? So there is a requirement to assess the need, then design tender, and then come out in market. Otherwise, you have seen there is almost a gap of one year from tenders being released to that being bid. I understand that gap, but the more fearful gap is from they being awarded, I mean, uh, the LCO, uh, the cost discovery to them get, um, getting awarded. And many tenders have got cancelled in this phase. Now, this is something which is not helping anyone, not the investors, not the developers, no one. So I think that needs to be reduced. Thank you. They're really helpful and good to know that it's the updating of regulation that also needs to happen, not new regulation all the time. 
Um, question for you, Ayush, is that financing obviously is going to be crucial for battery storage to scale up as well. What's the current ecosystem like for financing and what do we really need to do to get financing or, or you know, scaled up for batteries? Um, so, um, so I'll, I'll begin with the utility side of things, utility skill uh, side of things. Uh, so we've been working very closely with all the various like sort of leading uh, IPPs, solar developers, uh, both to do pilots as well as now, uh, you know, scalable like 50 megawatt hour, 360 megawatt hour kind of utility scale energy storage projects. Uh, I think from a financing point of view, I, the challenge that we see on the technology side is not so much because there's already a lot of energy storage projects that have uh, been implemented outside of India. I mean, globally speaking, Australia, US, UK has already seen a lot of implementation and these projects have been around for now three, four, five years. Um, the, the the sort of capital which is available to developers in India is the same capital that has implemented these projects uh, outside uh, as well and they have experience. So I don't see uh, capital fundamentally, the risk, the technical risk being a major uh, bottleneck over here and technology is only uh, evolving faster. I think the main challenge that we see is really the monetization of the asset like so today uh, you know all of these uh, revenue streams whether it is with fdre or with rtc even standalone are quite basic in nature like there is either a ppa which is a fixed tariff in standalone there is a fixed uh, you know lease that you get paid these are sort of good to begin with right to to kick start an ecosystem but Energy storage, like or, or especially battery-based energy storage system, offers a lot more to the power system. Like for example, the rate at which this asset can respond, which is like in milliseconds, is unprecedented. There's no other resource which is capable of uh, offering that kind of a service to the grid. Now there is no way today to monetize this, and there are very few markets which have started like sort of creating frameworks, you know, in terms of um, frequency reserve to be like sort of uh, to monetize these kinds of uh, services to the grid and I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done and to be honest it's incorrect to ask uh, the regulator to do everything on day one I think it's going to be a journey but they have to be really uh, sort of as they've said like you know this it's an evolving field and this is not somewhere where you can be stagnant and, and relax the moment a utility scale project is up uh, we really need to gather all the data, provide that data to the regulators, help them like sort of also, it's a feedback uh, to, to be able to come up with the right monet monetization mechanism for the asset, for all the services that the storage system can fundamentally provide. Uh, and I think that's that's what we will get to over the course of the next few years. Thank you, Ayush. Yeah, no, I agree with you that it's the additional revenue sources that really are required. With that, I think, uh, Rashad, uh, I'll come back to you about the fact that, uh, you know, you're closest to a lot of the new agencies and startups in this ecosystem in India. Uh, and uh, the larger question for you is, what is the biggest requirement for these startups to scale? Is it with the right policy regulatory support? Is it financing support? Or is it something else altogether that uh, the new companies require to really uh, make a mark uh, in India and help the energy transition story? Um. You know, I think it's all of the above. We've covered a lot of ground on in terms of financing and 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 policy. Um, you, you know, starting with the big picture, it's uh, it's uh, the point I think that I that I made that many people have made in different ways about this sort of just least cost resource um, or. or or resource adequacy approach and, and planning and, and tendering. Um, I think there's a number of other things that, that can, can happen to sort of create fertile ground for energy storage in in uh Indian um uh context. And you know, I think again, lots of people touched on the 
on the taxes, duties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this notion of, I think, aggregating and very, very active matchmaking between renewable, variable renewables and storage to provide clean firm power solutions to discoms, I think could be really promising. All of that feels kind of like foundational. You can, absent that, uh, you know, um, subsidies and incentives and support will make a difference, will keep companies viable for a while. But if you really, really want to realize the potential for this, you have to create the right regulatory foundation. And, and that has to be predicated on these pretty fundamental, I think, uh, these, these, these pretty important big picture um, regu e e you know, policy and regulatory shifts. The and I and and financing will follow, right? <laughs> uh, and and it's it's in many ways it's already there. At least from an international financing perspective, there is interest and the money is available. I, you know, I think there's something like thirty gigawatts uh, of backlogged, tendered, and financed projects that don't have an off taker that can't be connected to the grid or implemented right now. Um, you know, so the create the right fundamental policy and regulatory conditions, and I think some of these constraints will will go um, away. I'll make maybe just uh, a couple of other points. I think domestic banks in India continue to finance coal because it's subsidized, but I think that's short termism, right? Like this, <laughs> that's. Um, that's betting on the technology of, of the past that currently is only viable because of policy uh, and regulation that, as we've discussed, should change. And I think there's huge potential to reallocate, free up and reallocate that cap capital toward the technologies of the future. Uh, and then the last point I'll make is on the space in which we operate, which are relatively early stage technologies that are finding their way to market and commercialization. Um, and I, I think there is a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of potential to do more investor education for VCs um, and maybe early stage, uh, other early-ish stage investors. Uh, to get more sophisticated on the full range of technologies and approaches out there. And, you know, I talked a little bit about these before, the, the range of um, electrochemical approaches, flow battery approaches, mechanical storage, thermal storage, and what the individual trajectories look like in terms of unit uh, economics, the cost reduction potential for each, the best use case over time, how those use cases will evolve as India's needs go from very, very short-term storage requirements for, to much, much longer durations. Um, and, you know, I think Avana is an example of, of an investor, a private investor, and a VC that is pretty sophisticated on this stuff, but we need a lot more, either Avana to get a lot bigger, or we need a lot more of Avanas to, uh, to, to bet on the uh, I forget the exact phrase that you um, used, but, but bet on the right founders uh, and, and the most promising technologies that we're starting to see emerge. And that's where third derivative can obviously be helpful. Thank you, Rashad. Uh, we have the last 10 minutes, Kai, and this is the last question uh, for all of you. Uh, so I'll be quick about it. And I think uh, this is a question for a lot of the younger audience in quotes uh, who are uh, who will eventually watch this at some point that um, you know like for budding entrepreneurs who are looking to enter the space and it's it is an exciting space for uh, new entrepreneurs and new ideas to uh, to grow uh, what are the biggest and the most attractive opportunities that you would guide them towards and again I think I'll start with you Vaishnavi I would like to hear from you if you have anything to share on that yeah, so Arjun, I think, you know, this is an exciting growing space, but a lot of the discussion that we have had is depending on the life stage of these projects. And we are looking at more, uh, you know, building ecosystems, supply chains, etc. But what we also need to recognize is as the industry matures, there is this entire 
component of adjacent sectors that can benefit from the RE growth, which is the second life applications of batteries, uh, the entire recycling, uh, you know, capacities that need to be built to be able to, you know, deal with the PV panel uh, uh, waste that will emerge. So some of these may be underexplored right now, and they could be very good opportunities that need to be uh, tapped into as we go forward. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Rahul, anything to add to that? Yeah, sure, Arjun. I think uh, this is a very interesting space, exciting space. And uh, I think the biggest buzzword of uh, today's uh, era is AI. And that has a lot many application in the entire RE space, especially when we are uh, trying, uh, as I said, uh, we are moving from capacity to solutioning. Uh, that's when the entire forecasting, uh, predictions, uh, right, digital twins, so, uh, all those fancy words actually come into play now. And that's where uh, India definitely has an advantage and uh, which we should be leveraging on the entire energy management system uh, or let's say planning systems, all of those stuff. And uh, apart from it, I think uh, as uh, Rushit also highlighted, there are uh, numerous uh, storage technologies which are uh, fast emerging and uh, posing a challenge. Obviously, the scale is much smaller right now, but uh, India has a real advantage in developing some of them. For example, let's say the entire thermal storage or uh, entire carbon storage uh, that is fast emerging as, uh, uh, let's say, a suitable alternative uh, to a long duration energy storage, something, let's say, alternative to PHP as well, uh, being modular and can be co-located uh, right at the consumption stage. So these are the certain uh, things which uh, can be, which are uh, right now untapped and can be explored. Thank you for that, Rahul. Anand, over to you. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, just uh, what Rahul and Vaishnavi mentioned, sort of, same thing uh, resonates. I mean, uh, within the climate sector or net zero targets, I think energy is the largest energy transition, will have the largest contribution, maybe 70, 80% of the entire uh, uh, reduction or the net zero target goals. So within that space, uh, one can look at numerous things. Uh, well, in terms of, I wouldn't recommend manufacturing or, or any of that because China has an advantage and it's already commoditized. Similarly, an EPC, maybe not the contents of like quite a lot of them in India. So as Rahul mentioned, but on the software side and storage side, I would deep dive and see what is there. A lot of innovation yet to happen. So uh, on the distributor, what we're doing at Arama, we we approach uh, the the problem holistically from financing, uh, ecosystem issues, uh, integration um, with with grid and, 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 and taking care of power need of the industry. Uh, and then also we have a monitoring platform sort of that. So energy management system sort of graduating that to more sophisticated uh, uh, platform and then using AI and all of that. So some of these things we are doing. So these are, yeah, these are the sectors that are very much promising in the future. and. Um, and India has an edge in, in them versus a, a manufacturing facility where you would compete with uh, Chinese uh, Chinese manufacturers. Thank you, Anand. Ayush, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of the panelists had like some, some quite relevant like sort of ideas based on uh, you know what how they view the market as well. I think I've, I have. Uh, pretty much very similar type or category of spaces. I, I would say like software uh, wouldn't necessarily like sort of go down the AI domain, but I think like just creating good IT infrastructure, good products where India can be sort of the home market and the initial market, but like you're developing for the globe. And I feel like we have a very, very strong infrastructure to build software out of India. Uh, and within this domain, I feel like we should be building uh, more and more software companies in the clean tech space that are going global. Um, I actually think like engineering software. I was I was in fact surprised that you know even at, as an engineering organization, if you look at the number of engineering softwares that that we use, all of those softwares are actually developed somewhere else and. Uh, so I think like there is a huge amount of potential of building the next generation of those softwares uh, in India. I'm not even like going into the whole AI thing. I just think old school, good engineering plus 
IT uh, infrastructure based products. On the manufacturing side, I I have a little bit of a counter opinion. I actually think that uh, if you look at somebody like very recently, there's been a couple of these IPOs that have happened, right? Like if you look at Premier Solar and Mahi and a bunch of these, like they slogged it out for a good 14, 15 years, but at the end of the day, they've been able to do pretty well. And if you look at their scale, they are building good. Uh, they're building a very good business outside of India as well. Uh, again, I think there is substantial scope for uh, manufacturing, not not uh, simplistic goods, but slightly more specialized equipments that might be relevant uh, uh, in the supply chain. Don't. I'm not saying generalistic. Uh, equipments, but specialized for a particular application where you get embedded in the supply chain, and I see lots of potential uh, in in that space. And then the third one that I see is uh, around uh, uh, upskilling. So one thing that we see is that if, whether you take a look at this, I mean, solar solar industry has been around for a while now. It's been a decade and a half. So now you do have a fair like that that industry has a little bit of a mature. Uh, has hit some amount of maturity and you have training or upskilling businesses available where freshers can go and they can get upskilled. I don't see that yet uh, built out for batteries, EVs, all of that. And I think like there's a big opportunity around, you know, the educational upskilling side of things uh, for these upcoming uh, businesses. Those would be like sort of three spaces which I think are, if I'm an entrepreneur, like would be interesting. Thank you for that, Ayush. Uh, very quickly, Deb, anything from your end? Right? The disadvantage of being the last week, everything has been said, right? But, uh, you know, under so the forum runs this global shapers community and where we have these young innovators and entrepreneurs bringing in their ideas. The, in that, from that space, what I see is two things come out very importantly. The amount of attention that software is getting and software engineering, what Ayush was telling, the amount of interest that these players have in those areas and technology beyond uh, the whatever we are speaking of today, beyond those spaces, are two areas where I see a lot of traction and, and of course, uh, skill development is something we have to do here in a very big way. Thank you, Deb. Now for Rashad and myself, I know we're almost at time, so I'll keep it very short that all of this has been discussed as the kind of expectations going forward. Are you, is this in line with what you're seeing with the startups? Is there any other trend coming up in terms of the kind of uh, the nature of uh, startups coming up in India and also beyond India? Rashad, you can go Sorry. first. Yeah, my response, I think, might be a response partly to this and partly to your last question, like what should young people be thinking about or people that are entering the space. Firstly, like, you know, the, the talent in India is astonishing. India produces more than four times as many STEM graduates as, as the US and very, very high quality graduates. And regardless of whether you're coming out like with a, you know, a, a degree in mechanical engineering or electrical or chemical, like there is, uh, this is a massively exciting space. And so I'll, I'll maybe just, point to a few specific, I'll try to be specific in terms of the technologies that I'm the most excited about based on cost reduction potential and uh, use cases getting uh, sort of trending longer and longer in India. So on electrochemical, I think huge amount of promise with respect to novel lithium technologies. So things like uh, lithium sulfur, lithium air, solid state lithium. Uh, very excited about sodium alternatives. Uh, with respect to flow batteries, I think there's huge promise with respect to organic electrolytes versus traditional vanadium-based redox flow. On mechanical, I think more than compressed air, I think really um, uh, other working gases are, are really interesting. So things like compressed and liquefied carbon dioxide is the most obvious example. Uh, and then on thermal storage, again, you know, where, uh, if you care about, uh, especially if you care about industrial decarbonization uh, as well, solid or sensible thermal uh, storage, I think huge potential there. And similarly, um, 
uh, a lot of I'm really excited about the the potential with thermochemical approaches as well. So there's some very very specific sort of technology areas that I would love for more science and, and technology and engineering talent to be focused on or sort of steered towards. I will keep it very short, Arjun. We know, I know we are over time. I think this is Avana's bread and butter to work with young founders building in this space. I think the four things I think I would advise young founders to look at. I think look across the entire value chain and see where you can add technology differentiation. And it can be across uh, semiconductor level, power systems level, analytic software, end of life processes. That's one. I think second would be to think about innovative business models. As we've seen in the EV journey, uh, like battery as a storage or vehicle to grid, other interesting business models are emerging, which will going to happen here as well. I think third is to think globally. So what will work for India will also work for global South and Africa. So I think founders can be ambitious about that as well. And I think there is a lot of opportunity, particularly in India, to work with large, larger companies where they can work with the incumbents, uh, bringing the technology agility they have and, and the, the infra, the, the big companies have like Tata Power and the rest of them. I think there may be a lot of scope to work together for startups to, to thrive there. So yeah. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Pastel. And I think at the end, before we go, though, I want to do a quick exit poll because we know how accurate they are uh, as to do we think that by 2030, will we actually reach our uh, goals that India has set of 50% non-fossil fuel generation? If you think, if your answer is yes, I would like a thumbs up. And if your answer is no, I would like a thumbs down. So yeah, let's let's poll, guys. <laughs> oh, nice. Unanimous uh, winners we have here. So nice. Thank you so much for, for this, guys. Really appreciate you taking out the time. And we'll come back to you with some uh, exciting developments based on this uh, panel. So thank you and have a good week ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you.